Salut! Last time, I talked about Equipe Ligier, the winningest French privateer team in Formula 1 history. Ligier's time in the sport was turbulent at times, but the team had friends in high places that could get them out of a jam. While Ligier played the politics game to perfection and was a benchmark for picking your business partners, today's subject is the exact opposite. Murders and missed payments plague the story of the other, less fortunate of the two French privateers. Larousse Formula One. Gérard Larousse, like Guy Ligier, was a race car driver himself, but he was so much more successful in his day. He started his career in rallying, winning the French Rally Championship and Tour de Course in 1969. At the Monte Carlo Rally, he finished second three times in 1969, 70, and 72. In 71, he threw his hat into endurance racing winning outright at the 12 Hours of Sebring that year with Vic Elford, and later going on to win the 24 Hours of Le Mans twice with Henri Pescarolo as his driving mate. He made two starts in Formula One, driving customer Brabham cars for a privateer team named Scuderia Finato, retiring at the Belgian Grand Prix and DNQing in France. After retiring from racing, he got into the management business, acting as technical director at Elf Switzerland's Formula Two team for a while before leaving in 1983. He then moved on to fill the same job at Renault from 84 to 85 before they fully withdrew from the sport. After a brief hiatus, he decided to enter the Formula One circus in his own right and found his own team. And so begins the story of LaRousse Grand Prix. He forged a partnership with legal advisor and stockbroker DDA Calmels and struck a deal with Lola to build chassis. LaRousse and Calmel's Formula One entered the Formula One circuit in 1987, powered by a Cosworth DFZ engine, one of the few naturally aspirated engines being run at the time. They started with a one-car team, with former Ligier driver Philippe Alio behind the wheel, and got off to a reasonable start. They qualified for every race that year and scored three points, finishing six three times at Hockenheim, Harama, and Mexico City. At the Mexican Grand Prix, they expanded to two teams, hiring Yannick Dalmas to drive the other car. He finished 5th the season finale in Adelaide, but since he had started so late in the year, he was not eligible for points. Dalmas and Alio were retained for 1988, but the year was genuinely a step back. Dalmas DNQ'd for the Canadian Grand Prix, and then left the team after the Spanish Grand Prix, as he had fallen ill with Legionnaire's disease. Alio qualified for every race, but scored no points, with a best finish of 9th. After the opener in Brazil in 1989, Calmels had to leave the team because he had found himself in legal trouble. Now, normally when legal issues crop up in a racing context, it usually concerns financial stuff. You know, bankruptcy proceedings, wire fraud, tax evasion, bribery, embezzlement, that kind of stuff. Calmels' case was... special. He was arrested and sent to prison for murdering his wife. <laughs> Yeah, he just up and shot her because she was off having an affair with somebody else. He was sentenced to six years in prison, of which he served about 18 months, since shooting your wife because she's off screwing somebody else was considered a crime of passion in French courts, and got you a more lenient sentence under mitigating circumstances. So, if there's anything you can really take from this video, it's that the French legal system was f***ing weird in these times. Back on topic, Dalmas returned to start the year and DNQ'd for all but one race, the San Marino Grand Prix, where he started but retired after electrical issues. After Montreal, he got sick again and was dropped from the team. He was replaced by Eric Bernard for Paul Ricard and Silverstone, and then Michele Alvaretto for the rest of the season after that. Alio scored a single point at Jerez, and they finished 15th in the Constructors' Championship. Alio left to return to Ligier in 1990, and Eric Bernard came back to race for LaRousse full-time. Aguri Suzuki, who was backed by the Japanese communications company Espo, joined in the second car. LaRousse would have some semblance of a breakout year in 1990, with a point at Monaco, a double points finish at Silverstone, Bernard scoring a point at the Hungaro Ring, and Aguri Suzuki scoring the only podium of his career at the Japanese Grand Prix. LaRousse finished sixth in the Constructors' Championship, but there was a problem. You see, when LaRousse's upper management filled out their paperwork for the year, they put down their chassis constructor as LaRousse. This was not true, they were still being supplied by Lola at this time. 
It was an honest administrative mistake, but it ultimately cost them every single point that they scored that year. As was said in the Ligier video, this moved everyone below them up a place, bumping the other French team up to 10th from 11th, giving them all the goodies that came with scoring a top 10. LaRousse still got to keep all of the travel subsidies and waivers for pre-qualifying, but still, at least in the eyes of the FIA, they scored no points. In 1991, they signed a deal with Hart to supply engines, but that wouldn't last long as funds soon ran thin. Espo Corporation hit hard times and pulled out early in the season, which was a big blow in itself, but about the same time, France had passed its new law. Loi numéro 91 à 32 du 10 janvier. Okay, I'm gonna spare you from that joke this time. It's Lelo Ayavon. We talked about this last time. At the time, Camel was on board sponsoring the team, and Lelo Ayavon caused them to leave, which was also a massive punch to the wallet. On the track, the team scored two points with Suzuki and Bernard behind the wheel. The car was quick, but was about as unreliable as Kanye West's release dates. It would run mid-pack, in the points-giving positions at best, but would never finish the race as something broke. The team double DNF'd a whopping seven times due to these breakdowns. At Suzuka, Bernard had a bad accident in qualifying and broke his ankle, putting him out for the last two races of the year. He would not return to the Formula One grid until 1994, when he signed with Ligier. Bertrand Gasho, fresh out of prison, was signed to replace him. At the end of the year, a merger with fr fellow struggling French team AGS was floated around, but ultimately fell through. The team was saved from bankruptcy at the final hour though. Japanese company Central Park bought into the team and gave it a well-needed injection of cash, but not quite early enough to keep Hart and Lola on board. They had both left after LaRousse missed payments. Gasho was brought back for the 1992 season, and Central Park brought in Ukio Katayama to accompany him in the second car. LaRousse hired March co-founder Robin Hurd so they could design a car of their own, and Gerard himself sold 65% of his shares in the team to Monaco-based car company Venturi. The team scored one point, as Gasho finished sixth at Imola. Venturi would only last one year, as they sold their shares in the team in September to a venture capital company known as Comstock, owned by a German businessman by the name of Rainer Waldorf. Rainer Waldorf was an assumed name. The owner's real name was Klaus Valls. While it's already odd enough that he was going under a false name, the story gets even weirder. Klaus Valls was wanted in several European Union countries for his links to four murders. Four very violent murders. Not long after he invested in the team, the cops raided his house in France. He allegedly took the arrest very calmly and asked if he could grab something from his bedroom. Let's play a little game. What did Klaus go and get? A. His glasses. B. His cell phone. C. A hand grenade. Or D. A book to read. If you chose C, you'd be correct. He pulled the pin, ordered everyone to handcuff themselves to the furniture, and then went on the run with the police chief, who was then handcuffed to his car after he left. As for what happened to the grenade, he threw it away as he left, and it landed in a chicken coop. In October of 1992, a month after Comstock invested in the team, he was killed in Germany after a nine-hour long, yes, nine-hour, shootout with police. Gerard LaRousse was shocked by what had transpired here, as he thought that Valls was a nice guy. <laughs> <sighs> Due to Valls' death, he was granted full ownership of the team again, which could have been seen as both a blessing and a curse. LaRousse powered on in 1993 with an all-new driver lineup, with the returning Philippe Alio and fellow Frenchman Eric Comas, and new colors. They had gotten sponsorship from Cronenberg Brewery, and their cars went from predominantly blue and green to straight green to match their non-alcoholic drink, Tortel, which sounds like it tastes terrible. In countries where alcohol advertising was legal, they used checkered white and red for Cronenberg's title beverage. Alio scored two points at Imola, and Comas finished sixth at Monza, good enough for three points and P10 in the Constructors' Championship. But in 1994, the team was at its brokest and at its slowest. The team did its usual on its last legs things, hiring six drivers over the course of the year. Comas returned from the previous year, and Monaco resident Olivier Beretta accompanied him to start. 
Comas scored two sixth place finishes at the Pacific Grand Prix and the German Grand Prix before being replaced for the season finale by the legendary Jean Denis Delatraz. The second seat was a lot more volatile, starting with Beretta, then being filled by a returning Felipe Alio for Spa, then the triumphant return of Yannick Dalmas for Monza and Estoril, and then Hideki Noda for the remainder of the season. The team's one last time in the spotlight was at the aforementioned German Grand Prix. During the race, Benetton driver Jos Verstappen retired after a pit fire that was attributed to the removal of a filter on the fuel rig that made the fuel flow faster, but also made it more liable to spraying everywhere, which is what happened to start the fire. Benetton was supposed to have a hearing about this with the FIA, as this is a breach in the rules, but on the day before the hearing was supposed to take place, LaRousse told the FIA that they had been told to do this specifically by the manufacturer of the fueling rigs, Intertechnique Corporation. Because of this, Benetton escaped any type of punishment. That whole saga with Benetton in 1994 could be a video in and of itself, stay tuned. It was in the cards for LaRousse to take part in the 1995 Formula 1 season, and they even had a car built and a driver lineup announced, but they never entered a Grand Prix, as they had finally completely run out of money. Gerard LaRousse attempted to strike a deal with Jean-Paul Driot, co-founder of 3OR New Motorsports, now known as DAMS, to merge with them and continue racing, but the deal fell through. The future of the team depended on whether or not they could get a bailout from the French government from all the Cronenberg money they had lost due to Le Loi Evon. That money never came. They couldn't make their payments to Ford, who then withdrew the support for engines. A planned sponsorship with Patronus fell through because it was dependent on LaRousse making the race. Before the 1995 San Marino Grand Prix, LaRousse announced that his team was withdrawing and intended on coming back the following year. This was deemed impossible due to the multitude of lawsuits that he had over his head, so before the 1996 season began, LaRousse Formula One had officially died. Gerard LaRousse would not come back to Formula One ever again, but he did re-enter the endurance racing scene. He has served as the president of the 24 Hours of Le Mans Driver Club since 2008. Didier Calmels would attempt a return to racing in 2018, with a rumored deal with Schmidt-Peterson Motorsports to field a fourth car for the 102nd Indianapolis 500, with three-time Le Mans runner-up Tristan Gomendi proposed to drive for him. The deal fell through. Eventually, Schmidt-Peterson would partner with Meyer Shank Racing for the 2018 500, fielding the 60 car driven by Jack Harvey. Philippe Alio would not see the Formula One grid again after 1994. He would transition to GT racing and enter two 24 hours of Le Mans races after Formula One, retiring in 2006. Aguirre Suzuki would return to Japan after 1995, and would run a few years in Japan's touring car scene before retiring from racing in 2000. He would attempt to field a team of his own in F1 in 2006, which could also be its own video. But that ends the story of the LaRousse Formula 1 team. It showed promise early on, with a team owner and staff that knew that it was doing, but it was repeatedly given the shaft by fate whenever something good was going to happen. It makes for one of the sadder stories in racing, and a story that will shall live forever in infamy. And so that ends this video. I have been Bobcat205, and thank you for watching. How do you?